Hello everyone, my name is Vladimir and welcome back to the Architecture Weekly YouTube channel. This time I'm starting a new heading where I read through the books related to the software architecture and system design and share the knowledge of those books with you. Today I'm starting uh, with the chapter one of the database internals books, uh, where it tells us about how the database engines work under the hood how do they structure the data they write to the disk, how they provide the efficiency of storage, uh, update and access mechanisms, and so on. The second part of the book tells us about the distributed systems, about the problems of them, uh, about the consensus algorithms, and so on and so on. But today we're speaking about the chapter one. In chapter one, uh, Alex Petrov, the author of the book, uh, describes how uh, uh, the database works uh, under the hood. What are the questions uh, we need to ask ourselves to pick up the proper database for our solution? What is the architecture of a modern database engine? And uh, what types of database are out there for us to pick? So let's start. And before we speak about uh, picking up the database, we need first to understand why understanding the internals of the database is important in the first place. Let's start with the system architecture of a typical information system that we have nowadays, be it uh, online banking, be it a learning platform, be it a messenger or anything else. Typically here in the left, we see the mobile client, web client, internal web and other clients uh, that, that we have. Basically our consumers uh, interact with our systems through those user facing applications. And then on the other hand side, there's a iceberg of uh, internal systems of the backend. And there are API gateways, OWS components, microservices deployed to Kubernetes clusters or virtual machines or anything else. But in the end, all this data passing through all those services end up in the database where the, uh, the data from our users is stored and processed. And in order to pick up a proper database that will handle the load of our system will be beneficial for our system and helps us build a good uh, solution, we need to understand what is there to pick. What affects the choice of the databases? So first of all, of course, it's a number of clients. So how many people do we have? Uh, if we're building a system for internal clients where we have like a uh, hundred of them, or we're building a worldwide system where we'll have hundreds of millions of users every month. Another aspect is uh, schema and record sizes. So uh, relational databases uh, usually insist that you have some kind of a schema. So tables, data types for them and so on and so on. And uh, in contrary, uh, there are no SQL databases, for example, MongoDB, uh, which will allow to put any data into, uh, into their collections. And speaking about the database, we need to say that uh, there are different types of them. So first one are uh, databases optimized for transactional data, basically for the data which our users share with us. So profiles, messages, posts, and so on and so on. So we call those databases OLTP, Online Transactional Data Processing. On the other hand side, we have uh, analytical data databases. Uh, we call them OLAP, Online Analytical Data Processing. And uh, those databases serve as well when we want to understand some aggregations. Uh, in case of uh, internet uh, shop, uh, we will want to ask ourselves, uh, what is the best selling product uh, was last year for Halloween, for example, and uh, any other aggregations. And uh, uh, th there are, databases that are optimized for this. Also, there are databases uh, that try to combine both approaches. They're called uh, hybrid databases. For example, PostgreSQL uh, try to be this uh, kind of a hybrid database, uh, which uh, will achieve uh, to solve those tasks uh, with some database extensions. What else uh, affects the choice of the database? So uh, data uh, types of queries and access patterns uh, affects them as well. Uh, as we just covered, 
uh, if you want to put the user data in the database, you pick an OLTP uh, DB. Uh, if you want to analyze it afterwards uh, and uh, make some aggregation, some analysis and so on, you pick uh, an o uh, OLAP database, right? And of course, expected changes to all those parameters like number of clients, access patterns uh, and others uh, affects uh, the databases as well. So uh, we need to keep uh, those items in mind when we're picking up the solutions. Also, there's a list of questions that we need to ask ourselves when uh, choosing the, deep, uh, the database. So first one is, uh, uh, do those databases support the required queries? Again, analytical or transactional queries and so on. Uh, is the database able to support this amount of data? So uh, before you design the solution, you calculate uh, how much data you're going to store depending on the data itself, depending on the number of clients, uh, depending on the projected growth, and so on and so on. Uh, uh, what is the ratio between read and writes? And how many reads and writes can a single node handle of uh, the database of your choice? Uh, and uh, how many nodes uh, uh, will you require in order to handle all those data? And of course, how you will expand your database cluster with the expected data growth. So uh, even if you understand uh, what is the user base right now, you need to understand how it will grow and how it will affect uh, your database design, uh, how you, you will need to shard, uh, shard it, uh, replicate it, and so on and so on. And even uh, when you answer those questions, uh, the book still suggests that uh, you create a proof of concept with the simulated data and uh, test your database against this particular data, against this particular payload, because nobody knows your payload better than yourself. So once you come up with a new solution, please create a proof of concept and, and test, test the DB. And another suggestion the books makes uh, is uh, uh, looking into the source code of your DB. Uh, the, the modern database uh, are frequently open source, so like Pegasus database or PostgreSQL database and so on and so on. You can find uh, their source code uh, in GitHub and you might want to study it and see uh, how well it behaves, how it behaves in the edge cases, what is implemented and so on. Okay, next thing that the book does in this chapter, it shows the architecture of modern database. It shows the layers, uh, shows the different parts of uh, the engine and uh, prescribes uh, the purpose of those parts. Let's take a look. So here you can see the architecture of a database. So there are several layers. So there are transport layers, query, execution, storage uh, layers. And transport layers uh, is responsible for getting the queries from the client and communicate within the cluster. Next thing is a query processor. So once you ask your database for some data, like selecting something or updating uh, tables, uh, it will parse your query, split it into the tokens, and will try to understand what you actually meant. Uh, will validate the syntax as well, and, and so on. Uh, then query parses hands it over to query optimizer. Uh, and this component will try to make your uh, query really efficient. So it will remove the dead pass, it will uh, try to understand wh what index to pick, how to scan the tables efficiently, and so on and so on. And once the query is optimized, it will be handed over to the execution engine, where the query will be executed through local execution, so with the, with the local node, or maybe it will query some other nodes if uh, the, the data is split. And then, of course, uh, storage engine takes uh, its place. Uh, for example, when you're trying to update uh, several tables, it will require to come up with the transactions or transaction managers involved. Uh, it will try to lock uh, some of the rows that you're trying to update. So lock manager is required. We need to verify that the current user uh, has the access uh, to, to those uh, queries. Uh, we might want to buffer some data. And uh, of course, if something bad happens, we will need a uh, recovery manager. So this is, a, this is a short overview. So we can think about the databases uh, uh, as two groups, in-memory databases and disk-based databases. So uh, when we're speaking about PostgreSQL or uh, SQLite or uh, other uh, relational databases, they are disk-based databases. It means that uh, they firstly uh, write 
the data to the disk and only use uh, memory storage for caching or other pur purposes. In contrary to disk-based databases, there are in-memory databases like Redis, for example. They store primarily data in memory and only use disk for caching or efficiency purposes or replication or recovery and other purposes. Another classification that we want to apply to the databases is the storage of data. So some of the databases are column oriented and some of them are rows oriented. So uh, on the left uh, part of the picture, you will see the data that is oriented about columns. So imagine you're splitting your data into several nodes. Then some columns will be stored on the node number one, some of the node uh, on the node number two and some on other nodes. In contrary to that, the rows oriented databases on the right side of the picture are working with rows and they split the, the data by rows. So they, uh, in case of uh, sharding, that they will have some set of rows in, in one node, another set of rows in, uh, in a second node and so on and so on. Let's take a closer look. For example, we have a database with books. So we have a Dune uh, written by Frank Gerbert, we have Silmarillion uh, written by Tolkien and many, many other books. So those records, uh, they conclude a single book, right? So we have several fields that describe a book for us. And uh, this is how the row oriented databases store the data. So they write the whole row in the file, the next row, next row, next row, and so on. In contrary to that, uh, the column databases uh, store the data by column. So imagine the data about the stock price of some indexes like Dow Jones or S&P. And uh, here we can see the columns of IDs, symbols, dates, and price. And if we take a look how the database actually stores them on the disk, we will see the following. So there will be a column called price and there will be prices for all the records. And then there will be a column called date and there will be uh, dates uh, for all the records. But in order to come up with the data for a particular row, we need some link between a row and a column. And that's why you see the IDs here. So you can see the ID 1 and the price of 25,000 or ID 3 and uh, 48,500. And same applies to the date. Of course, this type of storage brings uh, their own benefits. So uh, the optimizations that can be done with a column-based approach is uh, vectorize CPU instruction, instructions uh, when, you, uh, when you can leverage the capability of the, uh, of the processor to work with uh, several items in a single instruction, uh, improving your performance. Or you can leverage the compression for the same data types because uh, we know in advance that we're working with, with numbers or we're working with dates and thus we can compress the data and store them more efficiently. The conclusion that you need to make right now is that you need to understand your access patterns. Uh, if you know uh, how you can access your data, how will you update the, your data and so on, you can pick up a more appropriate database. Speaking about efficiency, the question that you might ask is why do we need a database in the first place? Why we can't use just uh, plain files, uh, write all the data to the disk, uh, read them, uh, read those files from the disk and so on. But actually databases provide uh, us with uh, several improvements and optimizations. Actually, databases can do several tricks for us. So for, first of all, uh, it can improve the storage efficiency. If we just write uh, the data to files, we're losing on many capabilities that we can leverage, uh, which are implemented in the databases. For example, they can store the data efficiently, efficiently in the blocks on the file system, or they can uh, compress the data on top of, uh, of writing to the disk and uh, make any other optimizations for storage efficiency. Also, the access efficiency is much higher with uh, databases because they uh, know how to efficiently find uh, the information that you seek with indexes and other approaches. And of course, update efficiency is there as well for us because uh, if you can efficiently find a record, then you can efficiently update it as well. And uh, this is what databases do for us. 
actually uh, databases uh, use two types of uh, files. The first ones are data files where actually our uh, user data is stored and index files. Let's take a look uh, how the data files uh, can approach the storage. So first approach is the heap files. So you just write the data in the order that they come to your database. And uh, we call those files heap files because they're just heap of data, right? Another one uh, are organized uh, uh, files of uh, hashing algorithm. So if you are familiar with the hash map object uh, in Java, uh, the principle here is the same. So you hash uh, the file, so you obtain some number, and then you group uh, the, the data of, uh, of, of, of the same hash in the same bucket. So once uh, a, uh, a request for some data comes, you can calculate the hash again and find a particular bucket. Uh, and uh, in improving thus the velocity which with you obtain the data. And with this, you achieve the access efficiency, right? And another approach is index organized files. Uh, when you try to come up with our index tree and then store the data right in the index slips. But we will talk more about index files later in future videos. Right now, what I want to tell you about the index files is that there are primary indexes and secondary indexes. And uh, primary indexes are the ones that are created for the ID field of each record and secondary indices are the indices for all the others. So how do indices work? So imagine we want to find all the books of a particular genre, let's say science fiction. And database provide a data structure that will have the mapping from the genre and to the ID of the book that uh, contains that genre. And when we're searching for science fiction books, we ask the index in the database uh, to show us all the, all the IDs of the books of that genre. And then we will have the list of IDs and then we will be able to query uh, the actual records. Thus, uh, we achieve the access efficiency with indexes. And the indexes, of course, as I already said, they can be primary for the primary field and secondary indices for all the other things. Okay, the last thing that uh, this book uh, tells us are uh, database storage properties. So uh, we might uh, find out uh, that uh, some of the database are using buffering for writing and reading the data from the disk, and some of them don't. Also, some databases uh, uh, are using the immutable data structures. For example, Kafka is append-only storage, and some of them don't. They, they are able to uh, mutate the data that they store. And the last one is ordering. If the database uh, is um, storing the data in some particular order or just use the right order. And those properties are important uh, for understanding how the database work and we will get back to them in the upcoming videos. Okay, that's it for now. Thank you very much for the attention. I hope you liked the content and if you did, please subscribe to the channel, leave a like and of course leave a comment with the feedback if you want to get more details on a particular topic. Thank you very much and see you soon.